Good morning, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the HRAI Board of Directors, welcome HRAI and CIPH members to the webinar on the U.S. trade tariff situation. I'm Bruce Passmore, the HRAI Chair, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Uh, all of the lines are muted. We currently have 275 registered sites with multiple people at each site, so this could be the biggest uh, webinar that we've had. So uh, congratulations to the team for putting it together. Uh, on the control panel of your screen is a link to ask questions. We encourage you to send in questions at any time during the webinar. We'll be compiling them and posing them to the present presenters. Uh, a copy of the presentation can be accessed from the handout section on your control panel as well. Additionally, recording of this session will be sent to you following the presentation. So our guest speakers today, Jonathan O'Hara from Macmillan LLP and John Machia, from Livingstone International uh, will help to navigate the troubled and confusing waters that have been created as a result of these recent trade developments. So first off, uh, we'd like to welcome Jonathan O'Hara, partner, co-chair of the International Trade Group with Macmillan LLP. Jonathan, take it away. Perfect, thank you very much. So I'm gonna start with a bit of an overview of, uh, of customs duties just briefly and where they come from so we can understand uh, how we got in this current situation we're at with some, some very unfortunate and very exceptional duties. So just stepping back a little bit of a history lesson here, before World War I, customs duties were actually the main way that uh, the Canadian federal government earned revenue because there, there was no income tax. Income tax only came into effect uh, after World War I and then income tax became a more and more important source of revenue for the federal government, and customs duties became a less important source of revenue. And then if we fast forward up to, up to 1989, until 1989, goods coming between the U.S. and Canada were regularly subject to customs duties. Uh, and, and what changed in 1989 was the Canada-U.S. free trade agreement was concluded, and that meant that the vast majority of, of duties on goods coming from Canada to the U.S. went away. And so, excuse me, for, for about 30 years, we've been living under that kind of very favorable situation where there's an open border, goods can flow back and forth, don't need to worry about duties until just recently. So, so in 1989, there was the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement. Um, that was kind of the predecessor of, of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. And NAFTA came along in, uh, in 94 and then meant there was a, basically a free border from Canada to the U.S. to Mexico, and that really led to a lot of integration of, of the North American supply chains of distributors of companies, things like that. Now, North America is a bit of a special case because we all have that open border, but Canada still regularly imposes customs duties on goods from, from other countries where there is no free trade agreement. So, I mean, China is a big example. We import a lot of goods from China. And the, the very last point is just that uh, Canada-U.S. duties, you know, for 30 years, they weren't really much of an issue, but they have certainly become an issue recently. Uh, and so then if we could skip to the next slide, please. And these duties have become an issue because of one particular individual, President Trump. He's, he's, he's got some very strong views on trade, uh, and that has translated into uh, a lot of uncertainty, uh, changes in how international trade is happening, disruptions are what a lot of people would call them. So here on the screen, I just have three of his, uh, I don't know whether more famous or more infamous tweets about trade. And uh, I won't read them all to you. Many of you may have seen some of them, but this shows that President Trump is really taking a view that he is not reluctant to impose tariffs when he thinks that imposing those tariffs are going to somehow be beneficial to the United States. So if we can skip to the next slide, please. And, and just to highlight some of the things he's, he's done, we're really, really living in an era of significantly increased trade friction at least when it comes to the United States. Anybody dealing with the United States is experiencing significant disruptions to their trade. So, so President Trump was elected uh, in November of 2016, and every knew, everyone knew that part of his platform was going to be, he was going to withdraw, withdraw from trade agreements, he's going to try and renegotiate many of them. He did not think the United States was getting a good deal under many of those trade agreements. 
So shortly after President Trump uh, was inaugurated, he withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement, um, even though the U.S. had already signed it under President Obama. So the, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, that had uh, as parties Japan, Canada, Mexico, a number of Southeast Asian countries. So it's a little exceptional for uh, a country to sign an agreement and then I think it was probably about 12 months later just withdraw from the agreement. But that's what, that's what President Trump did. Uh, the U.S. is renegotiating NAFTA, as everyone may know. I think that's a, that's a very important topic that will come up a little later in my presentation. Um, then President Trump has already imposed 25% duties on $34 billion worth of Chinese goods. Uh, and that happened in early July because the United States doesn't like how China is treating some of its intellectual property. China retaliated with uh, duties in the same amount. And just yesterday, in fact, another round of duties between the two countries, uh, I think in the amount of about 16 billion U.S. was announced, and that's all going to come into force, I think it's August 23rd. So that that is a very significant trade spat between China and the U.S. You know, the world's two biggest economies, they have significant trade, and it just goes to show that, that President Trump is not shy about disrupting existing trade uh, agreements. The last bullet here is something that's in progress. Uh, President Trump is considering imposing duties on all foreign automobiles for national security reasons. And that, that would be, that, that's a huge deal for Canada and the U.S. given how integrated that whole North, North, North American automotive supply chain is. If we could skip to the next slide, please. So this, this takes us to the to the surtax countermeasure that is mostly what we're going to be talking about today. And, and just as a as a piece of context, I'm going to kind of give the the, the overall legal framework, the the context, the strategy, and then um, John Machia, he's going to get into some of those operational details of of how you calculate the duties, uh, to what they apply, and that sort of thing. So um, some of my stuff may seem a little bit of high level, but I am hopefully setting up. Uh, John to be able to get into, into some of the very specific details of that's of more interest. Just as a, a kind of a, a head note explanatory point, people have talked about duties, about tariffs. Uh, I'm using the word surtax here. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to kind of use those all three interchangeably. I mean, a customs duty is the, is the most common term I think that people use and understand. So I'll, I'll mostly use that. The idea is that when something crosses a border, you need to pay the border officials some amount for some reason to get to, to get that all the way across the border. So starting in March of 2018, uh, the U.S. Start imposed duties on foreign steel and foreign aluminum. And the U.S. justified this on the basis of national security, saying that having robust steel and aluminum industries is a matter of national security, and so they are going to impose duties on foreign imported steel and aluminum to allow their domestic producers to have a, a significant price advantage because they don't have to pay the duties, which would then make those domestic industries more, um, more financially successful, more stable, and able to invest further. And at first, those duties didn't affect Canadian steel and aluminum, but um, at the beginning of July, the U.S. revoked the, or sorry, the beginning of June, the U.S. revoked the exemptions that Canada and Mexico had had. And so as of June, Canadian steel and aluminum became subject to those duties. And that caused significant consternation in the, in the Canadian government across Canadian industry. So these, these duties under the, the U.S. Section 232, and you may see U.S. 232 as being kind of the term associated with these steel and aluminum duties, that had two consequences, well, at least two major direct trade consequences. The first is that a number of countries are going to try and put up um, safeguard measures, which are kind of often tariff barriers or, or quotas to prevent too much extra steel from coming in, steel and aluminum from coming into their country, right? So the Canada is worried that China used to be exporting a whole lot of steel to the U.S. It can't export steel to the U.S. and so it's going to export it to Canada instead, which would hurt Canada's interests. So that safeguard measure addresses that particular point. The second one concerns the surtax. Canada was extremely displeased that the U.S. had targeted Canadian steel and aluminum with these 25 and 10% duties. So Canada retaliated 
a month after the U.S. duties came into force and said, okay, well, we're going to hit your steel. We're going to hit your aluminum with duties. And on top of that, we're also going to hit a variety of your other products with, with 10% duties. And I think some of those other products are maybe interesting to the interesting to the listeners. I mean, one example is some water heaters um, are now being subject to a 10% surtax when they come from the U.S. into Canada. Uh, Canada is not alone in, repo- in imposing these retaliatory measures. The, United, uh, the uh, European Union has also done the same kind of thing um, and, and on a similar scope of goods. Um, so this, this surtax, the Canadian surtax, whether it's the 25% on steel or 10% on aluminum or other products, that's payable kind of in addition to any other duties that might have been payable. So most stuff coming in from the U.S. never had, did not have any duties because NAFTA made it duty-free. But even though they're duty-free under NAFTA, you're still going to end up having to pay the 25% or 10% as applicable. If we could skip to the next slide, please. So just a, a few points about uh, the surtax. The idea of the, the, the surtax is to retaliate against the U.S., to kind of encourage or even force the U.S. to lift the duties against Canadian steel or aluminum. Now, targets of the surtax are either steel or aluminum, you know, on, in the interest of reciprocity. Um, they've imposed duties on our steel and aluminum. We impose duties on their steel and aluminum. But we also picked some other politically sensitive um, products with the idea that if we hit, I mean, I'm, I'm using Jack Daniels whiskey that I believe comes from Tennessee. Uh, this is a Republican state. Uh, if we can hit kind of a, a key export from a Republican state, then there may be pressure within the Republican Party to say, let's lift those duties on Canadian steel aluminum because it's hurting Tennessee, it's hurting my constituents. And so as a senator, that is that is not good for my political viability. Uh, the Canadian surtax doesn't comply with the the World Trade Organization kind of international rules of trade. Most countries until recently had been willing to play by the by the WTO rules. Um, the United States has said that their duties are based on national security reasons, and so there is a, an exception under the WTO agreement for national security duties. Uh, Canada and, and many other commentators do not believe that having a robust steel industry is the kind of national security exception that was contemplated by the WTO agreement. Um, so, so Canada, at the very least, would say what the U.S. has done is WTO illegal, and we're responding with a surtax, which we acknowledge is WTO illegal, but we don't really have any choice um, because the situation is so grave. And what the U.S. has done kind of it was WTO illegal in the first place, so we're maybe not as bad because we're just responding to illegality with illegality. But, but this just highlights the very exceptional nature of this. Canada is a, is a big believer and a big advocate for the WTO. And so that it would do something that is not compliant with the WTO rules is very exceptional. I'll skip to the next slide if we could, please. This is this is a bit of a, an operational point, but the Canadian surtax applies to U.S. origin goods. And while it may be maybe simple to say that, um, you actually have to go look at the details to decide whether particular goods are U.S. origin or not. And there's some, based on the rules that the government of Canada has chosen to decide whether something is U.S. origin or not, there's actually a couple little catches in there where um, Canadian origin goods, where Canadian origin goods could actually be considered to be U.S. origin goods. Um, so it, you're, you're well advised to talk to your, your customs professional, whether that's a customs broker or a trade lawyer, just to ensure that when you think something is a U.S. origin, that it really is U.S. origin. If we could skip to the next slide, please. Right, so I'm... I'm having a, a little technical difficulty with my connection, but I'll... Uh, here we are. Nope, that's perfect. Everything's resumed. Um, so mitigating the the impact of these Canadian countermeasures, I think John is going to talk to this a little bit as well. But kind of the simplest and first thing that one would do is if you're supplying from the U.S. and you can supply from some other country, whether it's 
uh, whether it's Mexico, whether it's the European Union, or whether you can supply from someone in Canada, you may want to consider making that sourcing change so long as that new source um, is cheaper than paying the duties on the U.S. goods. But I mean, if it, if it costs 50% more to supply from Canada, um, and it only costs 25% more now to supply from the U.S., you're better off paying the 25% duty and going along. But to the extent you have alternative sources that are cheaper, definitely something to be explored. There are some specific Canadian uh, duty programs that in certain circumstances will allow um, one to get a refund of the surtax or to pay less of the surtax. Those are usually in situations where you're importing kind of raw materials or importing some kind of goods that you are then going to to process or do something with, or maybe not do anything with, and then ship it back out from Canada. So the goods that never enter the Canadian market truly, that there are ways under certain circumstances to avoid the surtax on those. And um, the other program that's relevant in some limited circumstances are is the, the Canadian Goods Abroad program. In some cases, I, I talked about a few minutes ago, Canadian goods coming back into Canada could be considered US goods under some of the particular rules that apply, and there's a way to mitigate that impact as well. Um, so I'll skip to the next slide if I could, please. Now, I'm sure one of the, one of the questions that, that is burning on everyone's mind is, uh, how long are these duties going to last? When are they going to go away? Um, or, or is this just something we're going to have to accept as, as a new normal and, and make business plans around it? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty around whether these duties are going to last for a long time. The Canadian duties are retaliatory. So likely as long as the U.S. maintains duties on Canadian steel and aluminum, Canada will maintain its surtax. And, and there's not really any obvious solution coming in the, in the short term. I mean, Canada wishes the U.S. would just lift the duties. But it seems um, politically maybe a little unsatisfactory for the U.S. to to say, okay, we're just going to lift these U.S. lift these duties on steel and aluminum unless they're getting something back. And so some of the possible solution scenarios that that exist are um, if Canada, the U.S., and Mexico can all renegotiate NAFTA, that one would imagine would deal with kind of all the trade issues between the between the countries and. And the U.S. may be able to go out and say, okay, we now have a new NAFTA. It's much more favorable. And because of that, we're going to lift these U.S. – we're going to lift the duties on aluminum and steel. And that, that – those two things don't necessarily logically connect, but um, that has been the, the U.S. position that these duties could go away if Canada will agree to a, a favorable NAFTA. Uh, it, it's possible that we may have to wait until another U.S. president is elected. Um, and in the hopes that that new U.S. president would lift the duties. I mean, a new president won't, uh, couldn't possibly be inaugurated until 2021 under the normal kind of four-year regime, absent some kind of uh, impeachment of President Trump. Um, but if President Trump uh, maintains this, this full first term and is reelected for a second term, then we'd be talking 2025 before there's a new, um, before there's a new president elected. So that's, that's not a very short-term solution. It's possible that the U.S. Congress will uh, kind of claw back the president's ability to impose these duties. If, if the U.S. Congress is really unhappy with what um, with what President Trump is doing, and there certainly seems to be some discontent, Congress does have the power to say, okay, President, you formerly had this power. We are now taking this back, and only we are going to have the authority to impose duties. So that could change things significantly. Um, the, the U.S. midterm elections are in November 2018. That could, you know, significantly shift the, the composition of the U.S. Congress. There could be more anti-Trump people in Congress. So it's possible that this kind of clawback would happen if the, if the makeup of Congress shifted significantly. And then the, the last point is kind of a, a question of a little bit of attrition. Uh, there are kind of exception processes both in Canada and the U.S. where parties can go to the government and say, can you give me an exception to these duties? It's possible that enough exceptions would be granted um, that the the measures didn't have a whole lot of effect, you know, maybe on the whole or even maybe just for just for your industry. And, and so that might be a, another possible solution scenario. The, the U.S. hasn't been very open about granting 
uh, exemptions, and, and Canada is just starting that process. Although Canada seems a little more reasonable from uh, from my discussions with government officials, um, but that again, that that's not kind of an immediate solution that we should be holding our breath for. If I could change to the the next slide, please. So I. I, I think that a NAFTA renegotiation is one of the one of the most likely kind of solution scenarios, but NAFTA hasn't the, the renegotiations haven't yet been successful. There does seem to be a lot of contention, a lot of difficulties in, in moving forward in that. And, and the trilateral negotiations have mostly stalled. There's some kind of bilateral where the U.S. is talking to Mexico and they make some progress, and the U.S. is talking to Canada and they make some progress. So there's there's some hope there, but but the uncertainty around NAFTA remains. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm running a little short on time because I want to make sure there's enough time for any questions. But if we could skip to the next slide, I'm just going to quickly run through um, some of the possible NAFTA renegotiation scenarios. So there's, there's really three large scenarios about NAFTA. The, the first is that there could just be a, a wholesale new NAFTA that Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. all agree to. Hopefully, as soon as that new NAFTA was agreed to, some of these these duties, like the steel aluminum duties, the retaliatory surtax, those all might go away. Um, it's also possible that the parties will agree to some kind of uh, skinny NAFTA, is what what I think some of the the media or some of the negotiators are calling it, where um, certain issues are parked because we can't resolve those, but certain issues are resolved, and so uh, there's a kind of a partial new NAFTA dealing with some topics that comes forward and is agreed to, and, and hopefully that level of agreement would also be enough for the U.S. to say, yeah, we, we got a good deal on the new NAFTA, we'll take away all these uh, steel aluminum duties, and Canada would say, good, well, then we don't need to retaliate on anything, and everybody could move forward. There is the, the third unfortunate scenario of the U.S. just saying, no, we can't conclude a NAFTA. We're going to completely withdraw from NAFTA. And it's a little unclear what would happen there because Canada and the U.S. are both still parties to that Canada-U.S. free trade agreement from 1989 that I started talking about. In theory, that agreement should kind of snap back into force as soon as NAFTA goes away. And so the U.S. and Canada um, may still have a lot of duty-free trade between each other. But if the U.S. withdraws from NAFTA, that suggests it wasn't able to get a good enough deal under NAFTA to satisfy itself. And so then it may not have the, the incentive or the will to lift those aluminum and steel duties. So I'm not painting a terribly uh, pretty or favorable picture, but that's that's where we are, unfortunately. And um, and that's the end of my presentation. We could move to the next slide, but that's just contact information. So, of course, I'm happy to talk to anyone. And if there are any questions now from the audience? It may be maybe a great time uh, a great time to raise them, and, and I'm happy to do the best I can to help. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Um, okay, so we'll look. We've got a couple of questions here. Um, one of them is. Uh, how do the U.S. duties on steel and aluminum help its national security? So, so that's a that's a very good question. The U.S. hasn't gone. That's a very good question. The U.S. The U.S. hasn't gone a long way to explaining that. Um, Canada and other countries have complained to the WTO, saying that this kind of national security justification the U.S. is advancing is, is very very weak. Um, that, that's not even a national security. So the, and at that point, the U.S. will be forced to say, no, no, here's why it is national security. Here's our evidence. Um, here's, here's the consideration. I mean, generally speaking, the U.S.'s position seems to be that um, steel is a very important part of the American economy, and having a robust American economy uh, is a matter of national security. And so, I mean, that, that seems a bit indirect and a bit of a stretch. Um, but we will kind of have to wait to see how the U.S. fully justifies this before the before the WTO, if it actually gets that far, because there will be a lot of people who will be very curious to to see how this is a matter of national security. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so another one uh, from Paul McDonald. Um, 
see here. So it's it's fairly clear the strategy of retaliation was to target specific U.S. states and thereby specify U.S. companies that sell into Canada. This either directly or indirectly affects Canadian subsidiaries of these U.S. companies. And so do the Canadian subsidiaries who have an investment and provide jobs in Canada have any recourse? Yeah, so the, the government is, is aware of those kind of implications. And for that particular situation, it sounds like asking for a remission order from the government of Canada is, is the best way to do it. The Department of Finance has put out kind of a formal process for applying for remission and some of the criteria and justification that they're looking at for remission. Um, and, and they are they are sensitive and do want to try and avoid collateral damage on on Canadian subsidiaries because those Canadian subsidiaries do you know invest in Canada, they employ Canadians, all of those kind of things. So um, the government of Canada is considering it on a fact by fact kind of basis. Um, and what what the solution there is going to be is a remission order saying you should allow these particular types of goods in without the duty because as a Canadian company employing or as a Canadian subsidiary employing Canadians, I need access to those duty free goods. Otherwise, you know these jobs may go away or the investment will be less or that kind of thing. The, the government is open to hearing those kind of concerns and open to open to acting on them. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Okay, um, so the next question regarding the uh, legal mechanisms available. So I think on your uh, slide number eight, you had talked about these. Um, are these actions to be taken by individual companies or can action be taken by ind an industry group like HRAI or the Canadian Institute of Plumbing and Heating? Um, so for example, you know, should we be looking to make an application to the Department of Finance for duty remission in retaliation to the whole class of products? Yeah, so that that is certainly an option, and there is strength in numbers in this respect. Having having a trade association kind of coordinate a, a large number of companies who would otherwise be making the same kind of assertions that that is very helpful. There, there may be. Um, certainly also some value in the trade association can kind of aggregate all the information from a bunch of different companies, um, which, you know, otherwise it might be inappropriate for the companies to share with each other. So there's certainly some value for the trade association going forward with respect to a remission order regarding, you know, particular products or, or a set of products. Um, with respect to the other kind of, so on that, that slide eight that you're referring to, that's the third bullet I was talking about, the remission order. The first two bullets, the, the duty relief and deferral programs, and the second bullet, the Canadian Goods Abroad program, that is really very company specific and even transaction specific. So that, that needs to be done by the by the company itself based on the company's particular circumstances, um, which is you know different than a remission order, which an, an industry, a trade association, an industry group could go forward and, and ask for. And it's probably more effective in some cases for the trade association to ask for the remission order than just one individual company. Okay, um, we do have several questions. Uh, I think we'll have time for one more, Jonathan, and then afterwards some of the questions that we don't get to, uh, we will definitely uh, work with Jonathan and send you a, a reply after the webinar. Um, so, <clears throat> from Dennis Kazina, if Canada does not have um, in-country manufacturers for a particular product, would Canada impose a duty or surtax on this product coming from the U.S.? So, yes. Uh, yes, it could, because the primary purpose of the retaliatory duties is, you know, to use a colloquial term, to, to punish the United States. So, it's not necessarily... Uh, primarily about protecting Canadian industry. It is about punishing the United States such that the United States has incentive to lift the duties. Um, it, it gets a little bit uh, less clear if it is hard to supply that product from anywhere in the world. I mean, if, if the United States is the only practical source for Canada, there's no manufacturing in Canada, it would be very expensive to bring it in from Asia or from Europe or something like that. 
then Canada might be much more open to um, the kind of remission order uh, that, that we just talked about, you know, whether it's a trade association going forward or a particular company going forward, um, th that the fact that it is hard for a Canadian supplier or for a Canadian supplier or manufacturer who needs a product where it's hard for them to obtain it, whether it's from Canada or elsewhere, that is a justification for a remission order in the government, you know, maybe very open to that kind of rationale. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. So right. now we're going to hear from John Machia, Director of Regulatory Affairs Canada with Livingston International Incorporated. John, take us away. Uh, uh, thanks very much. Um, let me just get my screen going. Uh, and, uh, thanks very much. Um, let me just get my screen going. And, uh, All right, uh, can you see my screen? All right, uh, can you see my screen? Um, I think you just have to enlarge it. Oh, there you go, I think. Okay, so we're gonna shut our microphone off now. Okay. All right. Um, thanks, everyone, and thanks for letting me uh, speak today. Uh, and thanks, thanks to Jonathan. That was that was great. Uh, I covered a little bit of what I was going to say, but what I'll do is I'll skip through uh, any slides that I feel are redundant or that you've already uh, talked about. So, uh, just a little bit about Livingston. Um, if you haven't heard of us, we're we're a Canadian customs broker uh, mainly, uh, but we have locations uh, right across uh, the U.S. Uh, and, and globally, actually, uh, but we are we're the we're the largest uh, customs broker in Canada and the third largest entry filer uh, as a broker in in the U.S. Uh, we have quite a substantial network uh, around the world, like like I mentioned, and uh, you know we pretty much have individuals on the ground, so we can we deal with issues uh, as the, as they come up. But let's go to the uh, to the presentation. Uh, that's my contact information. Um, and you'll have a copy of this presentation. So if you have any questions, just just let me know. Now, hopefully, I'll be able to to help you out. Um, just as a little bit of brief uh, in terms of the agenda, what I'm going to cover uh, off uh, a little summary in terms of what's led up to these countermeasures. Although, uh, like I said, Jonathan's pretty much uh, handled that already. Uh, the scope of the countermeasures, uh, some of the commodities that are affected by by them. Uh, how the count of the surtaxes is actually applied and and what we actually do to actually uh, pay the surtax and some uh, information that you may not be aware of uh, on the surtax and I'll finish it up with uh, with an FAQ uh, section. So let's let's get into it. So some of the events leading up to the surtax, like I mentioned, uh, Jonathan covered this off, but. Um, Surtaxes are kind of unusual for, for Canada. They, they don't uh, happen too often, uh, let's put it that way. Uh, so we're kind of in unusual times uh, in regards to surtaxes, but uh, we are where we are. So again, I'm not gonna go through the, the time frame, but um, you know, earlier this year, obviously the US uh, instituted their, their measures on uh, aluminum and steel products, not just from Canada, but from other countries. Canada then had a, a window of consultation with Canadian companies. Uh, Department of Finance actually received over a thousand submissions. Um, and what they have said to us is that most of the submissions were in support of the uh, surtaxes that Canada was contemplating uh, at the time. So they initially came out with a list uh, of commodities that were going to be affected. And then um, they, they took in consultations and then they kind of modified that list. So some of, some commodities ended up coming off of their initial uh, list, uh, but the majority uh, from what we could tell remained. So there, there was a few exceptions to it, uh, but overall uh, the list didn't, didn't really change. And there was really a, a match for a dollar for dollar amount in terms of what the U.S. Uh, was hitting us with uh, our um, steel and aluminum products going into the U.S. Uh, versus a dollar match for steel aluminum plus additional commodities 
that were uh, coming into to Canada. So July 1st was the uh, was the big day uh, when they took effect. Um, and like I said, surtaxes are, are pretty unusual. The last surtax we had in Canada uh, was against the EU, and that was on beef and pork products. And that surtax alone lasted for 10 years and actually ended in 2011. So, you know, sometimes these things uh, take quite a, quite a good amount of time uh, before they're actually uh, resolved. So, let's get to the details of how uh, the surtax and what the scope of it is. So, what essentially happened was the Department of Finance, like I, like I mentioned, um, came up with a list of, of goods and they placed them into three tables um, that, uh, that they've categorized. So, table one is a list of your steel products that are subject to a 25% uh, surtax, and then tables two and three are a list of commodities such as aluminum and a host of other types of commodities, kind of they vary uh, from one extreme to the other, that is subject to a 10% uh, surtax. And the countermeasures, they're the surtaxes, they only apply to U.S. originating goods. Um, and essentially what that means, as long as they are marked as U.S. origin, um, uh, origin goods, they're subject to, to the surtax. Um, and they're going to remain in place, like the government has, has essentially told us that, until the U.S. eliminates their, their restrictive measures. Uh, so if they wipe out their, you know, if they remove the aluminum and, and steel uh, measures that they have against Canada, then what we've heard from the federal government is that they will then uh, rescind the, the surtax or the countermeasures for U.S. origin products coming into to Canada. Uh, the countermeasures didn't apply to any U.S. goods that were in transit before uh, July 1st date, although most goods have uh, since now have arrived, but you could have the odd one, uh, you know, coming from a, a foreign, um, you know, Asian Pacific type of countries that may not have uh, hit the Canadian shore yet, so they may still still be uh, on in route. But today, mostly uh, the goods are are are, are the surtax is actually in place. So, like I said. Three tables, table one is the steel products, and they've broken it out in terms of uh, the customs tariff chapters. And what, and what this is, is it's a listing of all commodities and their uh, respective harmonized system numbers, uh, all coded by a unique uh, number, and they have uh, you know, a range of chapters. So they, they've targeted uh, chapters that pertain to that particular um, industry or, or product category. So steel products, uh, fall within two chapters of the customs tariff, uh, chapters 72 and 73, aluminum uh, chapters that are 76, or aluminum products in chapter 76, and other products, and this is the, the scope of a, a wide ranging scope from chapters four, which cover your agricultural type of products such as yogurt, all the way to uh, a chapter 96, which, you know, has playing cards. So it's, 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 broadly ranging. But let's look at some of the uh, details of the um, Department of Finance. Uh, so on the Department of Finance site, uh, you can see, uh, I'm just going to bring it up um, so we can actually take a closer look. But here is we're on the, I just put up the Department of Finance site. So these are the countermeasures in response to the uh, steel and aluminum tariffs the U.S. Uh, instituted. So you can see um, the steel products, again, are in are table one, and on the left-hand side, we have the actual tariff uh, item numbers of what they um, capture. The descriptions here are, are essentially based out of the customs tariff, uh, and they actually are. They're word for word from the customs tariff, so they're kind of uh, generalized in terms of uh, what they actually stand for. But uh, steel products essentially goes from ingots all the way to your coils, uh, steel bars. If I go down further, <clears throat> you can see how, how it's categorized. Again, what I'll stress here, the fact is, is that the tariff item number is at the eight-digit level. Um, and if for those of you who are very familiar with the customs process, um, the customs brokers and importers, um, have to classify goods at the 10-digit level. So you're not getting the complete 
uh, tariff item uh, number here, uh, there are two more digits that precede this uh, or follow this uh, in terms of, you know, individualized um, additional items that you may not actually see in terms of a description here, but you'd have to refer to the actual tariff itself or your customs broker would be able to uh, supply that number to you. But again, as you see, as I scroll through, you can see a lot of the different categories of goods that are captured by just that one uh, table, table one. If we move on to table two, you can see that these are the aluminum products. Uh, again, not as uh, detailed or long as, uh, of a list as the steel, but still you know, quite significant in terms of, of what it's covered. I think for, or for some of your products that are of interest to, to your members, probably will fall into table three um, more so than the other tables. But as you can see, like I said earlier, it starts very, um, you know, very different, different types of commodities ranging from yogurt. Uh, a lot of the food products are in here, the candies, the whiskeys, uh, some waters, soups. Uh, so if we move down further, you can kind of probably hear, I think this is their area more so of interest for your members. And you can see where we have, you know, stoves, uh, ranges, uh, parts, uh, refrigerator freezers, um, here combined refrigerator freezers, uh, storage uh, water heaters, dishwasher machines, and you know it, it goes on. Uh, so essentially, if you want to look this up yourself, it's the Department of Finance has the complete list. Otherwise, your customs broker should be able to supply you with a list in terms of what you've imported in the past. They usually, most brokers will have a tariff database uh, record of your past importations that they could uh, easily uh, supply to you. So let's go back to the presentation. And uh, I just want to cover just the, the accounting of the surtax. And what I mean by accounting of the surtax, this is when we as a broker actually pay it and how we calculate it out. Um, and some of this information may, may be known for those of you who are really into the, the customs process. But if you're not, I'm just going to do a real quick overview. This is uh, just an excerpt of a, of a customs entry. Uh, and I just used the example of the uh, refrigerator freezer. It falls under uh, this classification number of 8418, 10, 90, 90. So that's, that's the number we use as a tariff classification number for CBSA purposes. We have other, you know, bits of pieces of information that, that are required. But if we have a, a refrigerator freezer and the value, the Canadian value is $1,500, so let's just assume there's just one of them, and it's subject to a normal customs rate of 8%, we would simply multiply the 1500 uh, by eight, and we end up with a normal customs duty of $120. So this would be your normal duties that Jonathan kind of explained earlier. And most goods from the US, if they were um, under NAFTA, uh, would be duty free. But for this example, I just threw in duty just to kind of show you how this is actually calculated out. But if, it was, if there was no duty under NAFTA, then this would be obviously zero. But in this case, I've included 8%. So we take, you know, $1,500 times 8%, and we end up with $100, $120 in normal customs duties. Now, because this ref combined refrigerator freezer falls into table three, it's subject to a 10% surtax, which essentially means another $150 of surtax payable. Now, the $150 isn't assessed on top of the normal uh, customs duties, it's assessed in addition to it. So we don't charge duty on surtax on top of customs duty on top of the value of the of the item. So it's it's a, it's an addition to. So we take the 1500 plus the 120 plus the 150, and that gives us our value for tax. And essentially, that's what we base the 5% GST on. So I just wanted to cover that because we do get a lot of questions in terms of how the calculations work uh, of or the surtax. And the surtax is paid at the time uh, of, of normal customs accounting. So uh, for, for simplicity, essentially at the time of import. So when goods are imported and, and normal duties and taxes are calculated, uh, that's when uh, we actually make the, the payment to or owe the payment 
to the uh, federal government. Uh, so again, surtax at time of accounting, um, it's assessed in addition to any other duties. Uh, so if there's, you know, uh, normal customs duties, if there's anti-dumping duties, uh, SEMA duties, although we check all the products in those tables and none of them actually overlap for SEMA. Uh, this is SEMA is the anti-dumping and countervailing duties. So the Department of Finance was very strategic in terms of the commodities that they that they select, and not only for, uh, as Jonathan covered, the political uh, aspect in terms of targeting certain products from certain states, but they did stay away from any commodity that was actually subject to an anti-dump or a, um, a countervailing duty from, from the U.S. Um, goods that are imported under NAFTA uh, are still uh, subject to the surtax as long as they're on one of those three uh, tables. So if you have a NAFTA certificate, uh, yes, that will still eliminate your normal customs duties, uh, but it will not eliminate the um, the surtax. And there are uh, there are special end use tariff uh, provisions that uh, that apply to customs duties, um, but they don't necessarily apply to the actual surtax um, unless you fall into one of those categories that uh, that I'll cover off in a second. And Jonathan mentioned uh, uh, earlier. So, um, again, goods subject to surtax that are also eligible for chapters 98 and 99 provisions uh, continue to be subject to the surtax. And what chapter 98 and 99 provisions are, these are special provisions within the customs tariff schedule that uh, deal with um, special conditions, uh, end use provisions that if, for example, if you're going to import a particular item and you're going to manufacture it uh, into something else, uh, under the customs schedule, depending on the circumstances and what you're importing and what you're further manufacturing, provided re provides relief of customs duties, but it doesn't apply to um, the surtax. So a lot of our clients, um, you know, first believe that because they were they were in that category of those tariff provisions that they wouldn't have to pay the surtax, but uh, we've come to realize that that's not the case, uh, and even goods that are sent to the U.S. for processing and return. There's, there's a special uh, provision for that in terms of how the surtax applies, and I'll cover that off in a, in, a, in a second. But there are the duty relief and duty drawback back programs that are available that do uh, allow for the recovery uh, or the remittance of the, the surtax. Um, the duty relief programs you have to apply for uh, ahead of time, so you have to be approved. Um, before you can utilize it, the duty drawback program essentially means that the duty uh, surtax is actually paid out and it's recovered after after the fact. Uh, proof of origin uh, for goods not considering to originate in the U.S. takes the form of a standard commercial documentation or certificates of origin of some some means or another. So one of the questions we get a lot of is, what do I have to indicate in terms of um, showing that these goods aren't of U.S. origin. So it's just standard documents, customs documentation, uh, certificates that essentially state the origin of the commodity uh, being the country of what it is. So if it's, you know, Chinese origin, then uh, China should be indicated on the paperwork, especially if it's coming from uh, the United States. And refunds, corrections to surtaxes are, are available in terms of the, the completion on a B2 adjustment request. Again, more so just a form on how to uh, make corrections to it. So just a little bit of um, duties relief and duty drawback. Again, they're available. Uh, it covers not only normal customs duties, but it also incorporates the surtax. So uh, this was one of the big questions before the surtax was implemented, implemented was were these programs going to be available uh, to Canadian importers uh, and so the Department of Finance confirmed that, yes, that they continue to be available. So they essentially apply when goods are imported and they're later exported as is, uh, or they're imported for, uh, you know, for their manufacturing, or for the processing in Canada, and then they're exported. Uh, so if you fit into one of those categories, there is some relief of the, uh, the surtax. Again, depending on which, which route you take uh, and which program applies, uh, it could either be relieved initially or relieved uh, in terms of a recovery after it's paid out. 
the last one is the request for remission. Uh, again, Jonathan kind of covered this, uh, but this was um, just something that just came out maybe about a month ago in terms of um, you know the Department of Finance offering a remission to to Canadian uh, companies uh, who are subject to the surtax. Again, it's very specific in terms of when they'll grant this. So there's three main uh, conditions, uh, situations where it's short supply in the domestic market. Um, so to me, as if your product really isn't available in Canada or can't be found in Canada, not readily you know, manufactured here, it would probably be a good basis to, to apply for or at least request uh, a remission. If there's any type of a contractual agreement that existed prior to May 31st, um, for a Canadian business to use U.S. steel or aluminum products in their projects, um, then they would maybe uh, grant you a remission. And we had a client that was actually building a bridge uh, between Canada and the U.S. Uh, west, uh, and the contract was prior to the 31st, and they've uh, you know, made application for uh, a remission. So I think in that, in that case, I'm pretty sure they're going to end up getting it. Uh, and then they have you know, case-by-case -case exceptional circumstances that really may have a, a drastic impact on the Canadian economy. But in terms of how to and all the other conditions that go along with the request for remission, again, a customs broker, a trade lawyer um, can help you out, or you can you know, essentially do it on your own as well. The link is right there at the bottom of that slide. Um, it's a little tricky to find on the Department of Finance, but if you click that link, it'll take you right to it, and it kind of walks you through all the information that you need to make the application. Uh, I'm sure they've been bombarded with applications, so uh, it probably won't be anytime soon uh, in terms of a, a time frame for uh, when they'll respond, but uh, at least the avenue is there. Um, some uh, frequently asked questions on the surtax that we get, you know, are goods shipped to Canada from a place other than the U.S. subject to the surtax? Um, yes, as long as it's a, uh, you know, marked as U.S. Uh, origin goods uh, and it's shipped to Canada from a country other than the U.S., they would be subject to, uh, to, to the surtax. So if you have a U.S. product that comes from, say, Europe uh, and it comes to Canada, even though it's coming from Europe, if it's marked the U.S. origin on those documents or on the product itself and it's listed in one of those tables that I covered, it would be subject to, to the surtax. Any of the U.S. territories, such as Puerto Rico, um, U.S. Virgin Islands, um, America, Samoa, Guam, again, not that our, you know, we have that much trade with those territories, but uh, they all fall within the scope of uh, territory of the U.S. and, again, would be subject to, to the surtax. Uh, so how are U.S. goods sent from Canada to the U.S. Uh, for processing treated? So if you have a U.S. good, uh, origin good that's sent from Canada goes to the U.S. for processing. The surtax is payable on the value of the goods plus the processing uh, costs. So you, you you can't get around. Uh, you know, if you export something out of uh, Canada that's U.S. origin for you know for the manufacturer and process comes back, it's essentially surtaxed on the entire amount, value of the goods plus whatever the um, foreign company is charging for processing. Uh, the surtax apply on goods imported temporarily. So uh, in Canada, we have temporary import provisions where you know, certain conditions have to be met and they'll allow you to um, import goods and post a, a bond, for example, for goods that are coming in temporarily for special um, conditions, such as, you know, whatever, a show or trial of machinery. Uh, again, if it's on the list and it's U.S. origin, uh, the tax would be, would be applicable. Uh, another question we get a lot is with goods which originate uh, under NAFTA or import into Canada duty free, however, they are subject to the surtax. Uh, these goods are further manufactured and incorporated other goods and then exported to the U.S. Is the entire amount of the surtax eligible for drawback? In most cases, yes, you, you, if you meet all those conditions of the drawback program, you would be able to recover the, uh, the surtax. There, there are some, you know, exclusions in terms of scrap and waste that, that occurs during the manufacturing process, uh, but those are all covered within the program. But essentially, if you qualify for drawback, uh, you're going to recover the majority of your surtax uh, that's payable. One of, the, one of the other questions we get in terms of processing that I should have covered is when goods are exported from Canada to be repaired uh, and they come back. 
Um, what we've what we've learned is, is that uh, in those cases, when when a U.S. origin product leaves Canada, goes to the U.S., is repaired and comes back, and it's on the list of one of those tables, um, the surtax is only uh, payable on the cost of repairs. So it differs from the other scenario that I, I covered earlier in terms of the processing. So uh, repairs, uh, you only pay surtax on the um, repair costs, whereas if something is exported for manufacturing and processing uh, outside the scope of a repair, uh, then you pay on the entire amount. So additional information, um, obviously we have a, a lot of information on our website, Livingston. Um, we have an FAQ, we have uh, the complete trade dispute, uh, we have trade news articles on, on all of this. Uh, a couple of things just you know, in terms of you know, what you need to do. From a, from a broker perspective, it is really ensure, um, or from an importer and broker relationship, ensure that your, your tariff classification and the countries of origin are correct. So you really need to communicate with your customs broker to make sure that, you know, are you classifying or are your products classified correctly? So you may find that um, they, they, maybe they haven't been. Maybe that, that product that you've been importing all, all along uh, you've now realized is on the table, but um, you know it should, maybe it shouldn't be. Uh, but you can't change the tariff classification just to avoid the surtax. There, there's a lot of consequences to doing that. Uh, so I would I would definitely not advise you to do so. But if a product is classified incorrectly, then definitely a conversation with your broker uh, needs to occur. Uh, know which products you import are subject to the surtax. Again, your customs broker should be able to provide you an extract of your database, run it against the list of commodities, and essentially give you, you know, a, a report in terms of what commodities you import are subject. Uh, prepare your buyers for possible price increases, obviously, uh, other sources, other countries, uh, and then stay in touch with your broker for the ongoing updates. So I covered that pretty quick, but I know that uh, I'm pretty much reaching the end of time, so I'll just open it up, uh, or you can open it up for, for questions. Thanks, Sean. Um, you know what we're going to do? It's uh, it is 12 o'clock, and at the end of our uh, at the end of our deadline for all the participants. So what we're going to do is we're going to consolidate the questions and shoot them off to you for answers, and then we'll email them out to the folks uh, just with with some of the responses. We just don't want to cut in anybody's uh, extra time, if that's all right with you. Yeah, no, that's perfect. So yeah, no, that's perfect. thanks very much. So this ends our session for today. We would like to thank our speakers uh, from Livingston International and Macmillan LLP and CIPH for agreeing to partner with HRAI on this initiative. I hope you found the information to be informative and will participate in our future webinars. Uh, again, any unanswered questions, we're going to uh, forward them to you as quickly as possible to the speakers. And, and when we receive the responses, we'll forward them out to, uh, to the uh, attendees. And if you don't mind, please complete a brief survey that will appear on your screen at the end of the webinar. We use this information to improve the offerings as we go forward. So uh, your, your uh, contributions are very, very important. Have a great afternoon, and thanks very much to everybody for attending. And thanks to Sedia for uh, doing all the legwork. Mm -hmm.